Hello everyone and welcome to the Bronte Festival Women's Writing. This is our online session in conversation with Letty McHugh. My name is Sassy Holmes and I'm the Programme Officer at the Bronte Parsonage Museum and I want to thank you so much for joining us today and this is one of our first events this weekend so we thank you for being here and um, we're really excited. Now, Haworth is a very exciting place. Many visit the quaint village and walk up those cobbled streets, stepping into the world of the Bronte sisters. However, what is the experience of Haworth like from someone who lives there? Someone who grew up on the same streets as the Bronte sisters? Well, today we're going to find out. And I'm joined by the fantastic Letty McHugh, Haworth-based multimedia artist. Letty is an artist, writer and rhubarb enthusiast, which I just love that phrase, <laughs> based in Haworth, West Yorkshire. In the last six months, her poetry collection and lyric essay Book of Hours won the Barbellion Prize. Her installation Anchorage was shown at Attenborough Arts Centre and she's discussed rhubarb trifle on BBC Radio Leeds. What better place to talk about trifle? Today we're going to find out about Letty's process reflecting on her connection to nature and experience of observing the outside world as an artist based in rural Yorkshire. Welcome Letty, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Sassy. No, it's amazing to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's brilliant to have you here. And you can see behind me, I've got a little image of the parsonage, which won't be dissimilar to what you see on a daily, weekly basis and growing up as well. Um, so first of all, how do you like living in Howard? Oh, I mean, the best place in the world, isn't it? Yeah, I can uh, actually um, see the church out of my window if I like, wave at you <laughs> that's a lot of people's dreams view I think <laughs> um let's start with you I think can you give our audience kind of an overview of your work so far as an artist what do you produce what themes do you explore uh yeah so uh as you said I am a multidisciplinary artist and writer um and uh I, there's a quote uh, from Tracy Emin that I always think of where she said, um, I start out with myself and end up with the universe. Um, and I always feel like that kind of applies to my approach quite well because I think I start out with quite personal things um, that are personal to me and then um, spool out into kind of more universal themes from that. Um, mm. I think when you are talking about personal experiences are more relatable um it's easier to say like you know I am this person and these things have happened to me than just something generic so I often talk about um I guess feminism disability uh issues are what I explore quite a lot but I think I start from a personal experience and I, I would like to think that um if you're connecting with my work it feels like quite a personal connection and and it, yes I'm exploring those big themes but it's in in quite a human way yeah, definitely. Well, I definitely feel that. Um, what is your writing process like? Where do you begin when you come up with an idea for a project? And actually, it might not be writing. It might be illustration based. It might be textiles. I know you work across the board. So maybe where do you start when you've got an idea? Oh, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think for me, I actually always start with something that I want to figure out if that makes sense yeah so it's always kind of always starts with a question um so uh for a, I worked on a project quite a while ago now called this is your inheritance which was about um sort of female inherited textile skills and the kind of starting question for that was is it just me in my family who where everybody sews and all the women have learned to sew um and knit and crochet and all that stuff um or is it everyone? So that was kind of the starting point of the project. And then um, it went broader so that I interviewed a lot of different women about their own experiences. Um, and also looked at, I look at history quite a lot. Um, so I also looked at sort of the role that textiles have played through giving women a voice throughout history. Mm. Um, and went right, uh, <laughs> one of my sort of uh, obsessions, I guess, is we're kind of with medieval textiles. So I looked at that. Um, and then the project culminated um, in, I made an installation that's the same length as the Bear Tapestry um, and a book of essays because I can never just do one thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You've got a brilliant spread of things at hand. I feel like being a mixed media artist, you've just got your fingers in all the pots. 
yeah I think maybe also I'm just maybe like a little bit extra so I can never resist like doing a bit more I always got uh, my brother always says to me that he thinks my last words will be um I just want to tell you one more thing because I, <laughs> I say when he's like on the phone to me and he goes I need to go now and I go I, need, oh, I just need to tell you one more thing and that's kind of my approach to art it's like no I just want to do one more thing let me sew a thing let me make a video it's gonna be great it's brilliant. I like that. And I like the um, desire to like make more is really exciting. And there's an affinity there with the Brontes, which is lovely as well. Um, you've kind of touched on it already, but do, would you delve into some of the projects that you worked on recently? Maybe we could start with Anchorage at Attenborough Art Centre. I know that was that was a really brilliant piece, not only because it's, it's doing those textiles things that you were talking about as well, but it's quite interesting because of its size and also it, it's kind of installation uh, you're able to go in it um and I love the fact that it's trying to connect people together bring solace in these ideas of isolation or people with chronic illness um so could you tell us a little bit about that and highlight what was new what was exciting or what was unique for that project for you yeah so um Anchorage uh so to explain is um an installation uh, is actually made using a polytunnel frame. Um, and I have gone blank about the exact size, but I think it's four meters long and three meters wide. Okay. Um, and it's made, uh, the way I made it was I uh, sort, of de sort of modified the frame and deconstructed the uh, plastic part and used that to make a big pattern. Um, and sort of sewed it's made of calico which is like a beautiful um, sort of creamy colored fabric um, and I sewed it with the help of uh, my mom and my grandma and my grandma's sister um, and the idea came from um, in 2020 uh, I so I live with multiple sclerosis um, and I experienced a relapse of my MS uh, that really affected, um, I had quite a lot of light sensitivity, hence these glasses, um, and I kind of had to be in a room for uh, two or three weeks just with the curtains closed, and it was like right at the start of the first lockdown. Um, and sort of in that experience, I was, you kind of, you're thinking to try and keep your mind occupied when, when you're on a well like that. Um, and the thing that I kept thinking about was... Um, these ideas of like hermits and anchorites and anchoresses um so for anybody that doesn't know an anchoress would be a woman that um dedicated themselves to religion and traditionally uh kind of worked and lived in a in a cell usually attached to the church so the term anchorage comes from you're anchored to one particular church okay um and i was really interested in like what why would people i'm struggling so much with being isolated now through illness why would people isolate themselves on purpose was the kind of question of like mm. why that i started looking at um and i didn't really know a lot about anchorites before i started looking into the project i just sort of knew a little bit uh, enough to be interested so then i started researching them um, and i became really interested that uh, there's the a really austere traditional image of uh, even in the most extreme versions, people would be like bricked up into a cell and never leave. Oh, wow. Uh, but once I actually started looking into it, it it was a lot more nuanced than that. And it was a lot more um, people were quite connected to communities. So I found this instance where there's three anchoresses whose cells were all facing each other and they shared a cat and they would like chat to each other. Um, and so I thought just that, and they played a really important role in communities. So the cells would always have like windows um, that you could speak to people through. And I think I became really interested in that um, and kind of allegorical for my position as a chronically ill artist, because mm. I'm, so the size of the anchorage is the same size as uh, my bedroom. Um, and I just became quite interested because I feel like, a lot of the time as an artist I'm here in my house in Howarth um and a lot of the time maybe I, I can't leave but I'm kind of sending um art out into the world to try and connect with people right so um 
with Anchorage, you have this cell um, and it's kind of this idealized cell. Uh, there's like a white bed uh, in the middle and a wooden chair. Um, so it's this kind of like idealized I guess it's kind of playing on what would be the perfect place to be ill. Of course, there is no perfect place to be ill. Um, so it's kind of creating this space that doesn't really exist. But then there's also uh, there's a, a series of six films that um, both played in the gallery when it was in Leicester, but you can also still view on my website. So the idea was you're kind of the artist in the anchorage sending stuff out and trying to connect all the time um, through the art, I think was the... Uh, I liked the image of like a lighthouse so you're there and it's kind of beaming out and mm. you don't know where the light's going to reach and you don't know who's on the other side yeah that's really cool I think there's lots of um thinking about the, the idea that you were kind of in a room in kind of darkness for a long time um reminds me of Patrick Bronte when he underwent when um eye surgery for the first time and he was in darkness for two weeks I believe in a in a hotel room and there's something quite interesting about the the idea of feeling isolated from the world um and an art primarily is a way to to connect with people and put it out there but actually it, it can be quite an isolating thing so I think you're touching on some really interesting themes there and and the thing that you said at the beginning about making it personal and then it's speaking to everyone else is is really rings true because I think think your your story and your experience of the world is is really personal to you um but it it makes the artistic work so exciting and memorable and and then relatable as well yeah thank you yeah, it's great um so Anchorage is really exciting and that sounds brilliant and we'll definitely put some links to your website so people can go have a look. Um, but you've also recently won the Barbellion Prize for the Book of Hours. Can you talk to me about that and also what the prize supports and how exciting that was for you to win that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, Book of Hours is actually the companion uh, project to Anchorage. So uh, when I initially conceived it, they're kind of... Uh, to me they're sort of I'm I'm doing a link with my hands <laughs> they're, they're really uh linked on the same themes um I'll explain what the prize was first and then I'll go into the yeah cool. book. So, so the Barbellion prize is uh, a prize that is was set up um it's named after uh, the author Barbellion who lived with MS as well um and it's set up for uh to celebrate the author with uh writers with disability basically so i think it's like the writer whose work best exemplifies the experience of disability in a given year or something um and it was a massive surprise because uh book of hours is a self-published artist book um so i had kind of entered but not really expecting anything to happen um and it was a very pleasant surprise to to then be long-listed and shortlisted and going to win um and it's meant the the book has had a much bigger audience than I ever expected. You know, I uh, was on BBC Front Row discussing the project and all this wild stuff. Um, but it it's been really nice to kind of be recognised like that. Um, and I think especially because, as I was saying, it, it links in with Anchorage Book of Hours uh, is kind of exploring those similar themes of finding connection in times of isolation so the fact that so many people have read it and I've had feedback of people like reading it and saying it makes them feel seen that also makes me feel seen because they're kind of validating my experience so it's like a mirror uh like a beautiful relationship to me um so it's been really nice uh but I should explain what the book actually is um <laughs> so basically um the idea of book of hours is again they were kind of uh my obsession with medieval and early stuff uh so a book of hours through kind of the anglo-saxon medieval i mean that you can still get them now uh it was a book that basically told you what prayers to say um at set times of the day for every day of the year uh and when I was having that same relapse that I was talking about for uh, when I first had the idea for Anchorage, part of the idea, uh, I sort of had this fantasy of like dedicating myself to art in the way that um, 
uh, Anglo-Saxon hermit would be dedicated to God so that it would like it wouldn't matter that I was sick and hurting because I'd just be so dedicated to it right and um I sort of had this thought of like I wish I had a book of hours to kind of tell me what to think about throughout my day uh, as I was feeling unwell uh, but I didn't really want a prayer book um I wanted something that was kind of more relevant to my life uh maybe secular modern um and that's kind of where the idea came from of like, I was like well when I get well enough I am gonna write a book of hours that's like my modern day equivalent um and so that's uh the what the book became it's kind of a journey throughout uh it, it takes place over the course of a year um its subtitle is an almanac for the seasons of the soul so it, i sort of wanted to make it like about the cyclical kind of rhythms of the chronic illness year i guess which isn't necessarily the same as the calendar year but kind of how your feelings change and i think a lot of work about illness uh we often see the narrative with illness where it's like either you get better or you die. Um, and obviously with chronic illness, you're in a different space. Um, so obviously I will die eventually. <laughs> but, but it like MS doesn't really affect your life expectancy. Um, so you you kind of have that space of like, well, I'm never gonna really get a hundred percent better. Um, but so what like what is that like and what does that look like? was sort of one of the principles for the book um and I kind of did that same research about um people who've isolated themselves deliberately so I looked at various different um hermits and anchorites but also I was really interested in um this thing that I uh, I'm gonna try and do a good job of explaining but that basically that I think artists and writers are the people who would be the people who were hermits in the year 900 are artists and writers now mm. um and I kind of it was sort of about that I looked at lots of artists so again to talk about Josie Emin uh there was a famous time where she like locked herself naked in an art gallery for nine days in Edinburgh which I think is a very Anglo-Saxon hermit thing to do mm, yeah um and that kind of idea of idolizing suffering so that same relationship that of like suffering to make you more pure for religious reasons or like suffer for your art I think is a similar idea mm. and what that means when you're sick I was quite interested in that but also <laughs> because I never do a good job of saying that it's actually quite funny there's quite a lot of jokes in it as <laughs> well that's good yeah a little bit of humor in with the intense things is, is always great um yeah. how does it feel there's quite a lot you put a lot of yourself in your work um how does that feel does it ever feel draining do you feel kind of relieved from it do you feel like it's almost cathartic what, what what's that like as a process I think in a way um Anchorage and Book of Hours were my most personal project about my illness like mm. the most explicitly about what it's like to live with MS um and obviously that is quite difficult at times um I think like I didn't write up for my funding thing because I got DYCP to write uh that's a developing your creative practice from Arts Council England uh I didn't put in the funny thing like oh writing book of hours made me realize I could probably do it with a bit of therapy <laughs> to process some of this stuff um but also I think uh it was cathartic as well mm. because I um I was diagnosed with MS when I was 20 and I'm 32 now so it's kind of you have a different perspective and I think I was ready to talk about it in a more real way in a way that I hadn't been before um and I think you know at a certain point being real about what it's like to live with an illness is also kind of healing mm. it, it like you said it's, it's a relief to just be like yeah this is how it is yeah that's really interesting um you talk a lot about um your work reflecting on you and the, there's a lot of that about how like the way where you live in terms of living in Haworth but also in your immediate room and spaces um I wondered what is your relationship with Haworth and and you currently living there but also growing up there 
Yeah, so uh, this is a, a funny one where this is like quite a specific local thing. Um, I'm not actually from Haworth. Uh, I'm from Keithley originally, which for anybody that doesn't know is about half, like <laughs> maybe two miles away. Um, but for people who are like like the old Howarth families have been here for like 900 years so I'm not allowed to say I'm from <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah I think it is a really interesting place and I'm working um, oh, it's like spoiler alert but I've been doing some writing for Parsonage um, and working on that commission has been really interesting because it made me think in a way um, I don't this I don't know if this makes any sense, but like I've never really lived anywhere else. So mm. I lived uh for three and a half years in Bath when I went to university. And so when I was writing this project, I was very much like, well, well like what's normal? <laughs> what's weird? What's Howard? Because it's like, what's it like to not live in Howard? Mm. And I think that's the thing of you have such a different relationship, I think, to people who've spent, like you said, like all their lives imagining coming to Haworth and what's it going to be like. And you, like, if your first encounter with Haworth is through the work of the Brontes and you very much have this, you know, like you're going to see Heathcliff. Yeah. Um, and then when you live here, it's like you're going to the fish and chip shop and, you know, that Haworth Park is called Central Park. So when I was a teenager, I used to go into Central Park and pretend it was Central Park, New York. <laughs> um, and you just have this it's much more, uh, I guess, like matter of fact and mundane. And I always think that actually that's more what it must have been like for the Brontes to live here mm. because they were just living in an, in an, just like many other industrial villages in West Yorkshire at the time um, and it's kind of them that have made it remarkable mm-hmm. but it's also I think definitely it's such a beautiful place to yeah live in. Uh, and I definitely feel lucky about that I think I didn't um, at the bus route I used to get to school <laughs> was voted one of the most beautiful bus routes in Britain which is ridiculous <laughs> um, and you know, and definitely I think the people are great uh, and also not necessarily what you people imagine, but mm-hmm. definitely I think there's, um, I think being a product of this area comes out in my work a lot, uh, particularly because I think there's a certain sense of humour that's a very kind of Keithy Howarth sense of humour that um, people around here have. Um, and I think that comes through in my work quite a bit. Mm, yeah, definitely. And um, how do you think your relationship with the Brontes has changed over time? What do you think? It's almost like living with the Brontes when you were growing up. How does that feel? It's really interesting. Yeah, I was thinking about this as well. It's quite interesting, I think. It's probably, it's only people who grew up in and around Howarth that like your first experience of the Brontes is like as a biscuit. <laughs> as like the Brontes, <laughs> Bronte whole and broken biscuits or like uh, there's the Bronte Balti uh curry house so I knew the Brontes as like a takeaway before mm-hmm. um knowing them as writers and I think that's kind of gives you a different perspective um and I didn't read them obviously because you know you're not older but until I was a teenager but I also went uh, a lot of school trips to the parsonage um and you, I think you both simultaneously uh everybody from Howard kind of is a bit sick of the Brontes, but also is like really proud of them and really defensive of them. Uh, so like to give an example of that, I would say, I always feel a bit eye rolly about the fact that people call it Bronte country. Uh, but then last week I saw this thing where they said something about something that was happening in Halifax. I'm like, oh, this thing's happening in Bronte country. It's like, hang on, Halifax is in Bronte country. Get your own Victorian novelist, man. You've got Anne Lister. Leave that, that, the Brontes are ours yeah um, but and then I definitely then when uh I was like 15 I read Jane Eyre and sort of swooned over Mr Rochester and thought it was great and um kind of getting older and reading more of their books I think um definitely more recently um working on 
uh, I've been really interested in Emily mm-hmm. specifically recently because she was kind of the one that was at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, I'm in Hamworth quite a lot and I'm quite interested in sort of her domestic life. So, you know, like baking bread um, and being the one that ran the house and that sort of thing. But then also making so much space I think there's something in that people always say of it like female novelists especially of that era they're like oh you know isn't it remarkable that they were like doing a bit of sewing and then writing this book and it makes you really angry because like well of course you know I actually think it's kind of the perfect recipe to for creativity to become living a domestic life um and it, it gives you a lot of space for thought and um uh we do actually have an an image of it i think i have uh when i came to visit you at the parsonage we had a look in the library um and we saw uh one of emily's journal pages yeah i can share that now there you go this one here yeah that definitely really made me feel very connected to Emily as like a human living person um and it just you know it really made me feel connected in a way that I hadn't before with the fact that they were basically two minutes away from me and yeah. 200 years um doing the same things that I'm trying to do and that picture I think it's of Emily and Anne at the dining table uh, you know that's kind of because you can kind of see that they're sort of, I think and sort of leaning on her chin which I do and that made me feel really like oh you know they were just trying they were they were trying to do it mm. like I'm trying to do it and they were trying to make a life happen like I'm trying to make a life happen and also like that feeling of being disconnected from London which I definitely still get yeah um and the rest of the world feeling really far away mm. yeah. Um, it's really interesting to hear you say that and about kind of making them more real as people and, and living there and, and seeing them as kind of like real women, just like we are. Um, that's really, really comes out and is really strong. Um, you talk a lot about kind of the domestic sphere, but I wondered if uh, you could reflect on kind of the natural world, because obviously the Brontes spent a lot of, quite a lot of time out on the moors or in the natural spaces what is your connection and relationship like to the natural world oh yeah I I, yeah so that's also I think a real connection that I feel with them um because uh so at the age of 12 I moved with my family obviously into um a former parsonage on the Haworth Moors <laughs> so it's obviously quite a similar experience um and I spent um a lot of time in my childhood uh just kind of going for long walks uh my parents lived in a graveyard which <laughs> uh totally normal yeah um, and I would be um kind of in the cemetery with a velvet cape that my grandpa made me um and it's just having all that space to think I think I found that when I did go and try and live in a city well not that Bath's that big of a city but you know what I mean uh I missed the space and like I'm obsessed with the sky that we get here because you get such a big sky and you get so much like weather that's mm. not the same as in other places um and like the fog and I just think it's um you get it gives you so much headspace I think to be able to go out into the natural world mm. um and especially I think uh at the time the Brontes were alive that was probably one of the few things that uh you know, when women had space and could do things on their own was to go for a walk. Yeah. Um, and obviously that comes through in their work a lot, that that they're kind of connecting with this same weird, beautiful landscape. Um, and I think it's a thing that I really, again, the, the connection that I felt with Emily was to do with um, 
I guess sometimes feeling stuck because I, you know, I would have liked to move to London or be somewhere a bit more exciting when I was younger. And then learning to really appreciate uh, the kind of the beauty of the natural world here and and how lucky I am to be surrounded by that. And Mm -hmm. I guess the history as well. I, I know we've spoken before about like the fact that like the hills that we are on were connected to the Appalachian Mountains and uh, the Atlas Mountains. And this was all uh, a uh, a temperate, that's the word I'm trying to think of, a temperate rainforest. Yeah. Which, you know, explained that's why it rains so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and just that that connection of like all the stuff that's happened. I'm like, here, here I am, just the, the latest part of it, I guess. Yeah. That's so lovely. I love what you said about the sky and that brings us really nicely onto the latest commission that you've been working on. So excitingly, Letty has been commissioned by us at the Bronte Parsons Museum um, to reflect on her experience of living in Haworth, growing up in Haworth and your experience of nature when sometimes you can't always be outside and how your um, MS might affect that. Um, so I wonder whether you wanted to touch on uh, the piece that we've commissioned for you and then I can show some photos as well if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've got a um, shot. Oh, these, so what we're looking at now, are actually my journal pages that I was supposed to like make a really smooth point about how they connect to uh, Emily. But I didn't. <laughs> But like I'll make it now. These are my journal pages. Yes, I felt like was similar to Emily's journal pages. Yes, totally. <laughs> um, and they're kind of um, what I first started thinking of when I was developing the commission. That I know I already spoiled, but that's fine. Yeah. Um, that I've been working on this year for the Parsonage, which is called um, "You Still Have the Sky," mm. um, and that title kind of comes from a poem that I wrote that I'll read in a minute um and that was I guess inspired by the idea of um this thought that I had that even when my health is bad I still have this guy yeah (laughs) and uh you like there's still so much there's so many trees in Howarth that you can see that I can see from my window and there's so many like birds and all these beautiful things. I was really interested. Uh, I write about this in the commission. Um, so I already knew the temperate rainforest thing that I mentioned, that this was all a temperate rainforest. But what I didn't know is that in the time of the Bronte, there were no trees. Um, and uh, it's when Elizabeth Gaskell writes her account of coming to visit Haworth. She writes about kind of getting the train up from Keithley and there's... I think that a tree was nowhere to be seen, is what she says. Yeah. Um, but there's so many trees in Haworth now. Mm. Um, and I, I kind of thought quite a lot about that in terms of recovery. Um, mm-hmm. because my health hasn't been great this year because that's the nature of MS. Um, but I, I did think about that thing with the trees quite a lot. Of like, you know, things come back, things bloom again, things are really beautiful um so I will read the poem that I have written brilliant Um, so this is a short poem called you still have the sky you still have the sky and the tops of the trees which will one day be green again you have the roofs and the chimneys of the mill cottages you have the hectic glory of the jackdaws arranging themselves to roost some days this has to be enough Lovely, really, really lovely, Letty. And it's it's so, I feel like it, it's got such a strong sense of who you are, um, but also it makes me reflect on Haworth as a place and nature as, as a being as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, um, I mean, you'll know if you spend any time at the Parsonage, there are just so many jackdaws yeah <laughs> the trees and from where I live um all year round at the end of the day they're kind of for maybe 40 minutes are just like kicking off in like big plumes um and they really chatter and that like 
sometimes they're annoying but and that's the kind of the thing isn't it of like having mm. a relationship with a real place sometimes it's annoying sometimes it's beautiful uh, and that's kind of what I wanted to reflect yeah totally and I, I've got some more images here that you can give a kind of sneak peek to yes so, so that, uh, yeah yes the title page brilliant and uh, the view out of my window of the of the sky uh yeah this was um so if you can't read the text it says even in the tamest the tamest place the wild finds a way um that's one of my most recent obsessions has been about plant life exploding through kind of uh non-plant life friendly places so this is obviously a wall but like um flowers bursting in cracks of pavements and that kind of thing I always think it's so brilliant that plants do that because sometimes I get a house plant that I think I'm looking after perfectly and I'm giving it all the sunlight and attention it needs and it's still not happy. And these plants find a way to grow in cracks of concrete on the floors and walls. It's, it's amazing. Yes, yes, that is very like what I'm interested in. I always think about like, I would like to think of myself as a buddlier bush that like pushed through um an abandoned building but I think I'm actually like one of your houseplants <laughs> and looking after that's brilliant uh so this um is the drawing uh so one of the pieces that is included in used to have a sky is uh kind of a list of all the trees in the Worth Valley that I can think of without leaving the house um and this is the view of the underneath of the ash tree in my mum's garden as you're kind of laid looking up into the leaves it's brilliant it's really lovely and um this one here is so nice because it's kind of the the parsonage classic in black and white but I love your illustrations over it can you tell us a little bit about that yeah so this was the idea um like you said the parsonage uh and then it's what I've drawn over is uh, a bramble flower because I think brambles are one of those uh really beautiful plants like you say that that can push through anywhere um and I kind of liked the idea of that of because I also kind of link it to the Brontes in my mind that idea of kind of bloom while you're planted that they you know their imagination and all their ideas kind of pushed through in spite of their circumstances and the times they were in I suppose yeah really beautiful I wanted to ask you where humor, humor plays a part in your work. Um, you, the, you mentioned earlier you like to add like little vignettes of like fun and like lighthearted nature. And how do you weave that into something that can sometimes be quite serious? It's really interesting. I, I was thinking about this um, because in a lot of ways, I kind of feel uncomfortable acknowledging that my work has humor in it which is in part because I like I don't want to say that it's funny in case people don't think it's funny <laughs> um but it's also I think there's um when you're trying to be like a serious artist uh there's this kind of uncomfortableness with um especially when I was younger like oh no you're not supposed to make jokes like you can't put jokes in poems you can't put jokes in proper art Mm. Um, but it's, I think it's very much just part of my personality um, and like I said part of I think uh, I'm gonna say around it like <laughs> these parts um, everybody's always cracking jokes if you yeah. go into a shop course, you know the shopkeeper is gonna crack a joke with you um, and everybody's always trying to make each other laugh in this kind of slightly droll deadpan way I think which is part of like you're not supposed to acknowledge that it's a joke but it's always like a little bit of a competition. Um, and I think that just comes through because it's part of me. Mm. And I also think it's that thing of like, for me, um, some thought like you said, sometimes my work is about quite heavy stuff, but I think one of the ways of making heavy stuff feel safe is to laugh at it. Mm. Um, so you can approach it in that way and it makes it feel safer for people to think about, I guess. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, I could maybe read a bit of, from Book of Ours. But yeah, like, I was going to suggest that. That would be lovely. Illustrate it. Um, find it now. So this is a bit... Um, the book's split into sections. It's like faith and doubt, solace and uh, suffering or something. Um, and this is from the beginning of uh, the doubt section. Um, so I'll just... Uh, I'm going to read two pages. So I'll settle in. Um, 
In June 2021, I was given the opportunity to go on an artist retreat to Lindisfarne, a real-life pilgrimage to find inner peace, solve the scattered jigsaw of my con contradictory belief system, and finally become a proper artist. I wasn't putting any pressure on the trip. Compromise began immediately when accommodation on Lindisfarne itself was unavailable until at least 2023. So I stay in sea houses. There is a distant view of Lindisfarne if you leave the house and walk to the end of the street. Still, I am resolved that for the week I will live as a monk. I will keep to the schedule of the monks of Lindisfarne and pray at the eight watches throughout the day. Only this is a modern and secular project, so I redefine praying as this. Anything that opens my mind up to my heart, anything that opens my heart up to the hectic beauty of the endless universe. I will only do things that are edifying and disciplined. The following things will count. Blind drawing, writing, looking at the sea, sky or wildlife, reading poetry or creative nonfiction and yoga, which I have never previously done. I will not read fast paced fantasy novels. I will not fall down Wikipedia wormholes I will not spend hours scrolling on social media. I will not watch any reality television. I am a monk. I sequester myself in a former fisherman's cottage with a pretty pink door on a rubbly little road that falls away into the harbour. I make pots of tea and Google the fish and chip shop opening times. On the first day, I write four times and do yoga twice. I don't do any blind drawing. I don't read any poetry. I do read the guest book and make up daft little stories for myself about other people's holidays. On the second day, I write twice, but in longer stints. Better, I think. More concentrated. More disciplined. I do no yoga, do no blind drawing, read no poetry. I walk around to the co-op and get breakfast stuff for tea. Pancakes, bacon, sausages, strawberries. The monks treat themselves with a bit of mead or whatever at the end of a hard day being pious. I am being very disciplined. In the evening, I watch swallows flitting about the telegraph wires. I spend three hours reading about swallows' migratory patterns. I am convinced there is an excellent metaphor for faith in this. On The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Dorit Kemsley and Kyle Richards have an argument about glam squads. On the third day, I write once in the morning, proper stuff about faith and feelings. I do write again in the afternoon, but I accidentally start something about a gutter snipe in Victorian Yorkshire who can steal shadows and weave them into illusions. And that's not really edifying or disciplined, so I don't count it in my official tally. I don't do any yoga, blind drawing or read poetry. In the evening, I watch a boat bringing the National Trust staff from the inner farm. Remember an episode of the seminal ITV murder mystery series, Vera is set on the inner farm and try to decide who would be the killer amongst the current group based solely on their wellies. On the real housewives of Beverly Hills, Crystal and Sutton get into an argument that ends with Sutton screaming, Jealous of what? Your ugly leather pants! Across Kathy Hilton's perfectly manicured lawn. On the fourth day, I don't write, draw or do yoga or read poetry, I set out to walk across the rocks to a small tidal island adjacent to Sea Houses Harbour that has a small stone hut on it. I've spent nearly 20 years convinced this was St Cuthbert's hermit cell. As I'm scrambling up the final cluster of rocks, I start with migraine symptoms and have to turn back. In the cottage, I Google the little hut and learn it was never a hermit cell. It was a powder house used for storing gunpowder away from the harbour. Slightly loopy with my acute medication, I read about a campaign to restore the powder house and a campaign to put a plaque on the powder house in the honour of the woman who led the campaign to restore the powder house. I spend three hours reading the blog of a man who is visiting every island off the coast of Britain and Ireland. On The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Erica Girardi breaks down while telling Kyle Richards about her divorce. Erica Girardi is famously cold. It's unusual for her to display emotion on camera like this. I read several fan blogs that theorize she wrote she wore non-waterproof mascara deliberately to make her tears more visible and garner sympathy from viewers. That's brilliant, Letty. <laughs> I love the inclusion of the Beverly Hills. It's really interesting because the way that you write 
reminds me of how Emily Bronte and Anne Bronte write in their diary papers where it's the reality and the fantasy almost like blending into one and at some point you can't tell whether Gondol is happening in front of their eyes in the kitchen just like how Beverly Hills is happening just as you go down to co-op to get your breakfast. Yeah, definitely. I, that's one of the things that I felt. Uh, that's why I chose this passage because I thought it fit with a lot of the themes of that thing of being living a domestic life. But you've got this huge imagination, which obviously mm. Bronte's all had, and that thing of kind of reading things in, uh, reading meaning into the things that are happening to you. Yeah. So whether that's the swallows or a uh, certain crystal arguing about leather trousers. I think it's, you know, it's all there. It's brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been so brilliant to have you here today. I wondered if you could tell us what your future plans are, what projects have you got coming around the corner, what's next for Letty? Uh, Yeah, so uh, excitingly, I've got a project uh, called Joy in Unexpected Places that is also exploring um, the themes we talked about, about... um, flowers growing through cracks um so it's a series of drawings based on flowers that i've seen around the worth valley um and it's going to be made into um light installations which wow. will be played, uh around keithley for the bd is lit festival uh details we don't have the exact date yet but details will be on my website That sounds really exciting. And of course, your commission, You Still Have the Sky, will be available on our website and on your website for when um, the commission is ready for the Bronte Festival of Women's Writing. So if anyone's interested, feel free to head to our Bronte shop online and we'll also have copies in the Bronte Passage Museum shop in person as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Letty. Um, Finally, one last question. How are you a woman of the wild? Ah, that's a really interesting question. I think for me, the thing I thought about was, uh, which I wrote about in the commission, my history of kind of my family being famous <laughs> ne'er-do-wells in this area and the people of Howarth being quite wild um, historically. And I think that kind of is part of me. I, I hope that's kind of built my character. So that, that's why that's nice. it's in my bones. <laughs> it's in your bones. I love that. And it was in the Bronte's bones as well. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for watching at home and for joining the Bronte Festival of Women's Writing this year. If you're tuning into any more events, we can't wait to see you there. And uh, let us know how you found this event on social media. Give us a tag on Instagram or Twitter. Letty, are you on socials? Can we find you anywhere? Yes. uh, If you Google Letty McHugh, I'm the only one, so you'll find me. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. The only one! We love that. (laughs) Easy to find. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have a nice evening, Letty. Bye. Thank you. Bye.